Well, it's been just over a month now since COVID-19 flipped our lives upside down from having to practice social distancing, getting used to the indoors, to continuously washing our hands. And it's clear we're all going to be affected by the coronavirus, something none of us expected a few months ago. Many Australians will lose their jobs, others will have their hours curtailed, and most businesses will suffer. Right now, the government's throwing money at everything and anything in the hope of keeping the economy afloat. It's been spending close to $18 billion so far. But at some point, the lockdown is going to end. The handouts are going to stop. What happens then? Who's going to pay for all the government handouts? That's what I want to chat about today with leading economist, Dr. Andrew Wilson, chief economist of myhousingmarket.com.au. Welcome, Andrew. Hello, Michael. Yes, thank you. Well, the government's introduced a whole lot of stimulus packages yes. to minimise unemployment, to help businesses survive, to assist ordinary Australians put food on the table. And this is amounted to billions and billions of dollars. And where's the money coming from? Well, Michael, it's extraordinary times, of course. And in a sense, we're in a, a position where we don't have the same economic energy or leverage, particularly with monetary policy that we've had in other times of need. Of course, those other times of need have been economic shocks rather than the health shock. We're suffering at the moment. This time, of course, in searching for stimulus, the government is restricted uh, through the Reserve Bank with interest rates already being at record low levels and, and not much left to go. Of course, the other point is that there's not much we can really do in the short term anyway, when we're all locked in. Businesses aren't operating at full capacity, most of them, of course, because most workers are now uh, at home. And of course, that means that regardless of the stimulus packages, that it can't have an effect in that short term. If, yes, Reserve Bank has met to decide the direction over April. No surprise that they're leaving interest rates at 0.25 of a percent. No point to going to zero. But of course, there are other avenues for monetary policy. And we've seen the Reserve Bank now introducing quantitative easing to try to get interest rates down even further. So could you explain what quantitative easing is, Andrew? It is just another mechanism to get interest rates down. Now, you would have thought that, well, isn't that what the Reserve Bank does? Yes, well, it does. It's in charge of official interest rates, which to a large degree uh, generate mortgages and business overdrafts. There are other asset classes that have interest rate settings that are to some degree independent of official Reserve Bank settings. So what the Reserve Bank has done, and it's interesting because the Reserve Bank doesn't actually have any money, Michael. So it doesn't sort of move in, as we would understand it, a, an indebtedness position. The Reserve Bank has come along and purchased uh, billions of dollars in three-year government bonds from banks and major financial institutions. Now, why is it doing this? Well, what it does, of course, is if there's high demand, which it, clearly there is from the Reserve Bank, so as you get a higher price, a higher demand, the actual return on that bond, the yield on that bond starts to fall. So what that means is that it puts downward pressure on other asset classes, such as personal loans, and credit cards, and some business financing, which of course their rates, interest rates, are much higher than mortgage rates. So it's a process of pushing down government bond yields, which works to push down interest rates in all asset classes. So if I get it right, our government that's going to spend money supporting businesses, building those bridges as it's talking about, is going to borrow that by putting out bonds in the market. The market's going to buy those and the Reserve Bank is keeping the price of those bonds down. The Reserve Bank is keeping bond yields down and that means that the government doesn't have to pay as much interest on the money that it's essentially borrowing. Having said that, the debt's still out there. How's it ever going to get paid back, Andrew? Australia has been in a reasonably robust position comparatively. We would have likely, without the coronavirus, been in a surplus this year. And we look at other countries that are in significant deficits. The US is a good comparison. Pre-coronavirus, the US was running a deficit of around 4% of GDP. That was a trillion dollars. So it was already in debt. So in relation to our position, and that's important internationally, we were a 
a positive country in terms of our indebtedness, our government indebtedness. So that means going forward, any imbalances in terms of that international indebtedness, which show up in things like our currency, will have a reasonably neutral effect. And any sense of having to repay the debt is a simplistic view of the way our government balance sheets work. Going forward, all governments are going to be in significant debt. It will keep our currencies, I guess, reasonably stable in this sort of virtual world of everybody being in the same boat. But it's brought out the doomsayers, the naysayers, the people from overseas who say, the debt is so big, it's going to collapse. And I told you so. They told us that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, and now they're saying it again. Cheap headlines, Michael, it's clickbait. It's up to the people to buy into this rubbish. We've got bigger things to worry about at the moment, Michael, than you know the usual panoply of pinheaded doomsayers that come out of the woodwork under these circumstances uh, looking for a cheap headline. We'll move forward. It'll be a journey. We've never experienced this before. This is not an economic shock, and it's going to take a lot of work to get back to where we were. And when we, were, when we do get back to that, Michael, things will look a lot different and be a lot different than we've been used to before in terms of our economy and our social structure as well. But again, as I've said before, Michael, uh, being in Australia is probably the country you'd want to be in for a number of reasons. A small population still have very strong resource capacity. And uh, given that, I think that we'll be able to move through in better shape than most, if not all, from these uh, extraordinary circumstances. The trouble is forecasters can't forecast at the moment because you correctly say, there's just not enough current information about it or any historic information to help us. But some are suggesting this is going to lead to inflation and that's one way we're going to eventually repay our debt. What are your thoughts on that, Andrew? Well, bring on the inflation, Michael. <laughs> inflation is a reflection of high demand and prices growing. Bring it on and bring on higher interest rates. A lot of our uh, economic dialogue and analysis over almost the last decade has proven to be totally wrong. A lot of economists and policymakers are fixated on economic dogma, and that's proven to be wrong. I'm concerned at the level of not just government policymaking, but also the level of debate and uh, economic analysis that passes for, I guess, intelligent response to what's happening in our economy. And I think that's another thing that will change going forward from this, is that we're going to start to really re-examine some of the fundamentals of macroeconomic policy, particularly monetary policy. And that's a good thing because we won't be a hostage to the gobbledygook that we've been a hostage to from our policymakers over the last decade, particularly. But I just want to say something about quantitative easing, Michael. The issue with fo focusing on interest rates is it just hasn't worked since the GFC. Low interest rates haven't produced anything that we would have expected to them to produce in previous cycles. And this is why those predictions from economists and commentators are, will be wrong again, because they were wrong since the GFC. So what's going to happen now, Michael, with interest rates being forced down even lower, is I believe not, we're not going to get the same drive again that we've had through lower interest rates anyway. And the reason is that we don't have incomes growth to support those lower interest rates. People aren't going to take advantage of low interest rates if their incomes are stagnant. And of course, with people out of work now, and sadly more to, to lose their jobs, perhaps over the longer term businesses going under, income is going to be the real problem here in the economy, again, as it has been, but it's accentuated. So it's not much good if you've got really low interest rates, A, if you haven't got a job, and B, if you haven't got the money to take advantage of it. And the other factor, of course, is confidence. So you need the ability to pay for things uh, with job growth and wages growth. I agree with that. But once we come out of this, confidence will be shot for a while. That's right, Michael. And um, it'll be a journey for a couple of months. Let's just hope that the government can bring us back into more of a normal working environment sooner rather than later, because the longer we're in it, the more damage over the longer term we're going to do. And that is of great concern to me. Well, the government's more recently suggested that it is balancing the two things, the health of our nation and the economy of our nation, and it is a balancing act, as we've mentioned before in these chats, and at some stage they're going to have to forego one to keep the economy exactly. working. But I have faith 
maybe not in our government, but in humanity. And I think we're going to come through this. So I look forward to chatting again with you next week about this. There's always new things to talk about, Andrew. There is, and I agree with you completely, Michael. We'll come through it, but Australians know how to do the hard yards. We'll do the hard yards and we'll succeed. 